welcome to the appointment. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're in conversation with the Global Chairman of PwC, Dennis Nally. Dennis, appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Why are global investors so excited about India at this point in time? And, you know, why are people like you so excited about India? It's been a spate of reports. Deloitte put out a report just last month talking about catching the next wave. You're talking about the winning leap. What's got you so excited about India? Well, you know, we've always thought that this country has phenomenal potential. And, uh, uh, you know, in fact, this is my fourth visit here to India this year. Mm -hmm. um, demonstrates, I think, the uh, commitment that PwC has to... Uh, to uh, this country and the, and the success of it. Um, I, think, I think the thing that has changed is that uh, you now have a new government, uh, very pro-business, pro-investment, um, and pro-reform. Mm. Uh, and so I think it's creating, uh, without question, a, uh, uh, you know, a real uh, amount of, uh, of uh, excitement, to say the least, around uh, what the potential you know, not only is, but what it can be. And I think that's what's driving a lot of the interest that you're seeing from uh, many organizations about, uh, you know, how to, how to really uh, uh, help uh, India achieve that potential for the longer term. You know, you're, you're a long time India watcher, and you just said that this is your fourth visit to India in this uh, particular year. On the back of what you've seen this government <coughs> announce in terms of reforms, and some would argue about whether this is transformational stuff or this is just incremental stuff, what are you most hopeful about and what do you feel most confident about? I'll talk about the scenarios that your yeah. report paints, but in specific on the back of the action that's been articulated by the government so far, what are you most confident about? You know, I, I think it's early days. I mean, I think we have to be, you know, fair about that. But um, the, the fact of the matter that you, you, you now have a, a government that is really talking about, uh, you know, how, how, do you, how, how do you make it easier to do business here mm. in India? Uh, you know, how do you put the reforms in place that will give investors, you know, the clarity, the certainty uh, that they're looking for in order to, um, you know, put their capital, you know, in, uh, in this country? Uh, and that's uh, why people are so interested in what's really going on here. I the capital has <clears throat> started coming in, even if you look at the FDI numbers. FDI is a different story altogether, but FDI numbers mm -hmm. are actually declining for the second consecutive month. So the FDI is still yeah. cautious. Why do you think? Well, I think it's early days. And, and quite frankly, I think you've got to look at the FDI issue in the context of how other countries are doing mm -hmm. as well. So you just can't look at India as an as individual uh, country. I think you have to look at it in a broader perspective. Um, but again, you know, this is two months don't make a trend in my mind. Sure. And so I think this is really about, you know, what will the government do to, uh, you know, actually implement the types of reforms that are being talked about. And quite frankly, the international community is going to be looking for indications of, uh, you know, real, uh, you know, execution of those policies that I think are very important. So let's talk about the report because you believe that India can be a 10 trillion economy by 2034. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've painted three scenarios, a business as usual, which means that if we continue to push harder on the kind yeah. of stuff that we're currently doing, you believe we'll see a growth rate of about 6.6%. Uh, the winning leap is when you talk about a CAGR of 9%. Uh, do you believe at this point in time that India is perhaps poised for the 6.6, .6, the sort of do better what you're currently doing, or really move straight away to the winning leap kind of growth? Well, first off, I would say the 9%. Just to clarify, the 9% nine per, nine that we're talking about is over a 20-year time yeah. period. Yeah. So anything that's done in the early days has to be offset by something greater than 9% you know, to achieve the potential that, that, that you referenced. Um, <clears throat> without question, we, we think that this economy has the potential to realize that 9% average growth rate. But things have to change. Things have to uh, you know, really be addressed whether it's, uh, you know, the, the doing business environment, mm. whether it's the mindset to really drive major transformation within industry sectors, to think about uh, different ways to really, um, you know, capture those opportunities. All of this is a holistic way to think about the change and the transformation that uh, needs to take place in order to achieve those kind of aggressive goals. So what is the role that you actually see the government playing, whether it's 6.6 .6 or it's 9, uh, you know, from 5.6 trillion to 10 trillion? What is the role that you see the government play? Well, first off, I would say uh, it's not just about government, and it's certainly not just about the private sector. You know, in order to achieve the kind of uh, goals that we're talking about, um, 
and both have to be working in a very collaborative way. So government has an important role to create the environment, to create the policies that really encourage the type of investment that's really necessary to drive this type of an agenda. Mm. Business, on the other hand, you know, has an important role to play to really drive the innovation, the creativity, uh, to be able to leapfrog past a business as usual strategy and have the risk appetite to really move in that direction. So uh, whether it's private sector or government, both have to work in a very collaborative way to really drive this type of an agenda. But government spending on things like education, healthcare, mm. physical infrastructure, yeah. Uh, clearly, to be able to achieve the $10 trillion uh, goal by 2034, the government has got to put in a lot more money. Given the fiscal constraints and yeah. the need to go back to fiscal consolidation, yeah. how do you see that evening out? And that is precisely the point that governments can't do it on their own. In other words, if you look at the amount of investment that would be required just to deal with health, for example, or just to deal with education, mm. Um, you know, it's a staggering amount when you think about, uh, you know, those types of challenges that are existing just in those two sectors. Infrastructure, uh, another great example. Um, the government does not have, you know, the financial wherewithal to do it all on its own. They do have the ability to do some mm. from an investment standpoint, but more importantly, they have the ability to create the right type of policies, the right type of frameworks that will allow uh, uh, outside investment to really be a part of that. So, Speaking of you know, frameworks and policies that encourage <clears throat> public-private collaboration as far as the infrastructure space is concerned, and this has been an experiment that we've seen play yeah. out in India over the last uh, decade or, yeah. or so, successful in some areas but not successful in many areas. What is it that you would like to see change? What do investors tell you about this public-private partnership framework that they would like to see change to encourage more private investment into physical infrastructure? So, so first off, the, the notion of a foundation that has clear rules, that has clear accountability, that has um, you know, a long-term view that would allow for investors to get comfortable that the risk-reward that is inherent in a public-private partnership can actually be achieved. And I think the framework for how that's established is absolutely critical to really encourage that type of investment, mm. whether it's in infrastructure, health, or any one of these other sectors. Um, and I think that's where government can play a really important role to create the right type of environment, the right type of a framework that would allow uh, investors to get confident that by uh, investing today that they're going to have stability of those rules and regulations over a longer period of time. Do you feel confident? You talked about stability of policy. Do you feel confident with this government saying that we will not go back to an era of retrospective mm. action? Of course, the law remains as is. But do you feel confident and do investors feel confident about policy certainty, tax certainty now in India? Look, I think it's early days. Um, you know, I think that's one of the big concerns that, that exists here. I'm certainly not going to talk about taxes because that's a subject that I, I think has gotten a fair amount of, of discussion in, in, the, uh, in the public debate already. But, but what business is really looking for is that consistency of application. Um, and they just want to know what the rules are and mm -hmm. they want to have clarity of those rules to, to be applied so that there can be no second guessing, uh, you know, on a retroactive basis. And it, taxes is just one area where that's so important, uh, you know, for uh, the reform agenda to really be successful. So early days, the right the messages are being delivered, mm. uh, the proof of the pudding is going to be in the execution. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, you talked about the role that the government can play in order for us to achieve that growth. So let's talk about the role the private sector can mm. play. And in your report, you say that at least 10 Indian companies will find a place among the global top 100 by size and scale if India aspires to be a $10 trillion uh, economy. Where mm. do you, which sectors do you believe these companies are going to come from? Well, I, I think that they're going to come from a number of different sectors. But, you know, for example, when you think about financial services, uh, you know, having, you know, a major uh, financial services player, you know, in that type of uh, space is absolutely critical. Health, clearly the opportunities for, you know, uh, health to have a major player, you know, in India playing okay. at that level. Uh, and what's interesting, the reason we cite that more than anything else is, you know, today's economy, um, you know, companies need to be competitive from a global standpoint. Right. Um, you know, whether it's uh, global supply chains, mm -hmm. whether it's um, the ability to attract talent, um, you know, if you're not globally competitive, best in class, um, you know, this country won't reach its true potential. And that's why we cite that 
as just one example of an indicator of uh, the successful transformation of uh, the economy here. So what do you see as being India's mm -hmm. big competitive advantage today? Economies of scale and manufacturing is clearly the China advantage. Uh, innovation, R&D is clearly the India advantage. At this point in time, if I were to ask you, going beyond mm -hmm. labor arbitrage, what would you say is the competitive advantage? You know, I would tell you first and foremost, I think it's demography. Uh, mm -hmm. When I look at the population here and... Uh, so consuming uh, middle class. As well as the ability of a very young population to really drive the kind of transformation and change, I think that is a phenomenal, uh, you know, asset of this country. Um, you know, education system, uh, uh, the, the fact that this is the largest democratic uh, uh, society in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you've got a number of advantages that, uh, that really are strengths of India uh, to be really leveraged, uh, you know, over the next 20 years. And that's why I think people are so excited about the potential of this so country. If, if you had done this report 12 months ago, would you have been able to arrive at the same conclusions today? Because the democratic dividends, the demographic mm -hmm. dividends, all of mm -hmm. that is constant. That hasn't changed yeah. significantly over yeah. the last 12 months. The only thing that's really changed is, is the government. If you had done this report 12 months ago, would you have come up with the same conclusions? I, I, I think it tells you how important it is to have not just a phenomenal private sector opportunity that exists, which we've all known for years and years and years, I, I think it, it does require a government that is very much aligned with the type of reforms that need to take place in order for those benefits to be, be achieved. And mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. That's what's fundamentally different. Um, it's not a new thought, as we all know, uh, but it absolutely demonstrates how critical it is to, uh, to reach the potential of this economy is to have government and the private sector working in a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, together uh, format to, mm. to, to realize the potential here. On that note, we're going to take a break, but when we return, we continue our conversation with Dennis Nally, the global chairman of PwC.